There once was a man who was filling out a form for a job and came to a question on the application which said, what is your church preference? The man thought about the question for a little bit because he really needed the job and he wanted to impress the employer. So after a while he answered very confidently, I prefer a red brick church. It's so easy to misunderstand what church is all about. The past few weeks have seen some instances of the institutional church forgetting what we are here for. Just this past week, hearts were broken as the United Methodist Church decided to recodify discrimination against God's LGBTQ children. I know many of us here have watched as friends and family in that tradition have struggled to make sense of how the question of whom shall we love could be answered any differently than everybody for the church. And our own tradition is still struggling too. The Lambeth gathering of all the Anglican bishops around the world will happen next year. The week before last, the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion announced that same-sex spouses of bishops will not be invited to that gathering. Thank God for one of my former bishops, Mary Glasspool, and her wife, Becky Sander, who have both said that they're going to go to Lambeth anyway even though Becky may not be allowed to fully participate. Bishop Mary wrote to Archbishop Justin Welby and asked him, when will the church accept the gift of LGBTQ people? And when will the church value love as its top priority? The inclusion of LGBTQ people has become a flashpoint, a symbol of a larger cultural shift in society around us. But I think for us in the church, we miss the point if we simply make it about who's in and who's out, and about political partisan identity, about culture wars, about conservative or liberal, about whether we prefer red brick churches or Gothic cathedrals. This is about our identity as Christians. This is about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. This is about our tribal identity, but not as Republican or Democrat. It's about our identity in baptism. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and we have the story today of a Jesus who went up on the mountaintop with three very sleepy disciples. And as they're about to to nod off, the disciples anyway, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus and start to talk to him about his upcoming departure. Departure in Greek is exodus. Moses and Elijah have both already been through their own exodus. They have already departed from one place to go through a wilderness and arrive at a promised land. Now they're here with Jesus to talk about Jesus' departure, Jesus' exodus. Peter wakes up in the middle of all this and he misunderstands what's happening. He wants to stay up on this mountaintop with these important people in dazzling white. He wants to set up a place to stay and revel in it. But then this booming voice corrects Peter quickly and 
the next thing you know, the whole group has descended off the mountaintop. And they've gone down into this scene of sickness. A place where healing is needed. A place where faithlessness abounds in the disciples. A place that seems so distant from the mountaintop. But that's the place Jesus goes to rather than hanging out on the mountaintop. The transfiguration, to me, is one of the most important events in all of the Christian story because it connects the incarnation with the crucifixion and resurrection. The one who came to be with us, born in a manger, revealed by magi who offered gifts, is now dazzling in glory on this mountain, but he doesn't stay there. Instead, this Messiah chooses to come down off the mountain where he's immediately confronted with the brokenness of the world, with sickness and faithlessness. Rather than being content to be lavish with gifts and dazzlingness like a king, this Messiah descends from the mountaintop even though the brokenness below will eventually cost him his life. The glory of this Messiah doesn't really come from living up above. It comes from descending down below. This Messiah came especially to be with the world. So if Jesus was not content to stay on the mountaintop, so then the church must not be either. How often does the church seek to recreate a lost past, to set up shop on the mountaintop, to keep its hands clean? The arguments recently in the Methodist church and about Lambeth are so much about who is allowed to go up to reach the mountaintop? And who's allowed to stay there and set up shop? But maybe that's not the question our head priest asks of his church. What if the call of our head priest, the call of our Messiah, is to be an Exodus people? to be, let my people go, folks. We need a place to come and recharge, to get comfort and food for the journey, but, but what if God could care less about who gets to climb to the top of the mountain? And what if God is much more concerned about whether or not the church will descend the mountain to reach out to the hurting? Because when the church gets stuck on being gatekeeper for the mountaintop, when it refuses to acknowledge the value of every human being down the mountain, like in Lambeth decision or the Methodist decision, we fail. When we believe the church is here for our own pleasure, for our own protection, and not to be the body of Christ in a broken world, we fail. What might a church built around coming down off the mountain look like? Could it look like a showers ministry where the church is also willing to be transformed as it hears the needs of those in community around them? resulting in a new community transformed, working together to both provide basic needs and friendship for those living outside in our neighborhood? Or could it look like a refugee ministry where the church offers assistance to those in a literal exodus and reflects on the history of the other people of God who have been in exile, resulting in a community coming together to help keep a family together during unjust deportation proceedings. We experienced that last week. 
Could it look like a pastoral care ministry where the church meets the sick, bears witness to physical pain, treatments that seem worse than the illness they are intended to hold back and prolong death? We're holding close to our own Messiah who came and suffered alongside us and died. St. Paul is involved in all of these things. Living in Exodus, however it looks, it's the crux of the Christian life. And it's the crux of the Christian life because it results in transformation, in new life. It results in liberation. Nobody said that Christianity was a cakewalk. Christianity coming down off the mountain to live as Exodus people, it's hard. But we follow one who shows us a transformed life, one that leads to liberation. And it's just because being an Exodus people is so demanding that we need mountaintop experiences. We need to be able to come together and be recharged by beautiful music and by sacraments and the Word broken open, the acts of worship that make us new again, that make us whole again, that reconnect us and help us remember that we, together, we are the body of Christ. We are loved. We are loved individually. We are loved corporately, and we are loved, all of us, this whole human project. And there's a promised land at the end of this exodus that is bigger than any of us individually and that none of us can achieve or reach on our own. At St. Paul's, we've got a pretty well-defined rhythm of going to the mountaintop and descending down into Exodus. We've got worship that goes way up on that mountain. LGBTQ inclusion's so settled here that, that even some LGBTQ people are tired of talking about it. We've just adopted a list of peace and justice principles and we're working on how to put them into action. How else can we come down off the mountain even while we make sure that we're taking care of each other, coming back week after week to be nourished by our wonderful worship and our sacred community? Because without that sustenance, we can't do it time after time after time. Because it's the life of Exodus. It's the let my people go life. It's that life that leads to liberation. It leads to the promised land on earth as it is in heaven. The church's job is to partner with the life-giving God to be a liberating force in the world. And it takes all of us together with God's help to do it. So thank you for being a part of it. And now let's baptize some babies.